the tour and get back down, it'll occupy that two hour block. So plan on 12 to 2, Friday, November 6th. Um, you're all welcome to come, you're all welcome to bring your cameras, all that kind of good stuff. There's no classified work at LBL. It's a very open environment. Uh, we'll show you everything we can. The only issue will be safety related things. The cyclotron is scheduled to be running that day and the main concern is not exposing anybody unduly to any radiation. So there may be a few places we can't go, but other than that, it's all open. The one thing that the lab does ask is we need to get a list of all the people who are non-US citizens. So if you're not a US citizen, of course you're welcome, there's no problem, but please send me an email and let me know your nationality. I just have to provide that information to the lab before they give us access. Yes? I would, if you're a US citizen, let's just call it a US citizen and let it be that. I think that's a little too much information, right? Um, any other questions? And before it gets to that date, I'll give you information on how we get up there on the bus. Um, any questions about that? Uh, da, 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 da. What is this little bit? I looked at this before. No. The 9th is a Monday, and yeah, so this brings up an issue, okay? According to the syllabus, the second exam is supposed to be the week of November 9th. Uh, I like the way the first exam went in terms of the scores and having the two-hour block, which I can only do on Friday. So I would tentatively propose having the next exam on Friday, what must that be, the 13th? Lucky Friday the 13th? Now, before you agree to that, let me just point out that there's a holiday in that week. Wednesday the 11th is a holiday. It's a university. Is that okay? Let's assume it's going to be Friday the 13th, okay? Huh? It'll be through everything we covered up until then. Right, right. Yeah. If, you, if there's a real conflict, we can work it out, okay? Right, right, okay. Okay, so the tour on the 6th, exam the 13th. Any other questions? Okay, so we're gonna continue the discussion of nuclear reactions, and I wanna clarify a point. I think Steve Astelos mentioned this last week, but a couple of students came during my early office hours on Monday um, to talk about this. And this has to do with the issue of how you compute um, energies w in terms of which reference frame you're using. And in almost all the discussions I've done so far, I've been describing a laboratory situation where I have a stationary target and a moving projectile. Okay? That's called the laboratory frame. And it's a convenient frame because that's where we do most of our experiments and most of our work. But in terms of calculating how much energy is needed to make a nuclear reaction actually occur, it's not the most convenient frame. And so we talk about what's called the center of mass or the center of momentum frame as opposed to the laboratory frame. So the lab is one in which I have a projectile and a stationary target. And remember that in all the um, reactions and the case studies we're looking at, energy and momentum are absolutely conserved. And so if I'm in a laboratory frame, where I have a moving projectile and a stationary target, that system has a non-zero momentum it happens. And that momentum has to be conserved, which means my final products, whatever they are, cannot be produced at rest, okay? Because that would violate conservation of momentum. And so in this example, A plus X make B plus Y. B plus Y have to be moving after the reaction to conserve both energy and momentum. And if you think about it, what that means is that a certain amount of energy is tied up in the kinetic energies of B and Y simply in order to conserve momentum. And that energy isn't actually available to cause a nuclear reaction to happen. So if you want to calculate what's called the threshold energy, the minimum energy needed to make a nuclear reaction happen, it's a lot easier to compute it in the center of mass frame or center of momentum frame. And that's a frame which relative to the laboratory is running along in this direction at the velocity of particle A. So that particle A then appears to be at rest in that frame. Sorry, it's not what I, never mind, it's not true. It's a frame in which particle A and particle X are both moving with equal and opposite momenta, such that the sum of the momenta is zero. 
Okay, that's the center of mass frame. I was talking about still another frame of reference. Uh, so in the center of mass frame, there is no momentum, there's no net momentum before the collision happens, and therefore the two product nuclei that get produced can be produced exactly at rest, because that also has no net momentum. So in that frame, you can calculate how much energy is required to make the reaction happen, and then to figure out how much energy is needed in the laboratory frame where we're actually going to do our experiment, you need to make this conversion from lab energy to center mass energy. Okay? And unfortunately, Lilly's book doesn't actually have this, but if you have Crane's book, or if you go to the library and look at it, in one of his appendices, he has the transformation worked out from center of mass to lab. Okay? And for non-relativistic collisions, which is what we're dealing with, there's a very simple relationship between the center of mass and the lab. And that's basically that the, the transformation from the, from the lab to the center of mass effectively reduces the energy available by this ratio. Okay? And what I've written here is um, the opposite. I'm going from the center of mass back to the lab now. And so if I have a reaction, and the example I've chosen is lithium-7 plus a proton making beryllium-7 plus a neutron, if I go to the back of Lilly and calculate what is the Q value for that reaction, it's minus 1.644 MeV. Okay? If I add up the mass of lithium-7 and a hydrogen atom, and I subtract from that the mass of a beryllium-7 and a neutron, it's minus 1.644 MeV. And so you might think if I bombarded lithium-7 with a hydrogen atom with 1.644 MeV, I could make that reaction go. And the answer is no, you can't because I can't produce the beryllium-7 and the neutron at rest because I'm bringing in momentum with my hydrogen atom there. And so I have to provide a little bit more energy to do that. And the amount by which I have to increase it is the mass of the target plus the mass of the projectile, which in this case is 8. I'm just rounding it off to AMU. It's close enough. Divided by the mass of the target, which is 7. So I need 8 sevenths more energy to make the reaction happen in the lab. And so I take 8 sevenths and I multiply it by 1.644, and I get 1.879. That's how much energy I would actually need to have in my hydrogen beam to make that reaction happen in the lab. Okay, so that's a simple example of transforming from center of mass to lab or vice versa. And Crane has a nice detailed explanation of that. But it's essentially this ratio. It's the ratio of the sum of the target and the projectile mass is divided by the mass of the target. And you'll see in this case, it doesn't make much of a difference because I mean, obviously 8 sevenths isn't a huge correction. The reason for that is that the mass of the projectile in this case, the hydrogen, is small compared to the mass of the target. But look what would happen if I had equal masses here. Suppose this was a helium-4 on a helium-4. Okay? Then according to this formula, I'd have 8 over 4. It'd be a factor of 2 difference. So if I have equal masses colliding, there's an enormous difference between the energy available in the center of mass versus the energy in the lab. When I have a light projectile on a heavy target, it's a small difference, but nevertheless an important one if you want to get the right answer. I think there's a homework problem that asks about this, and that's why I'm going through it. Is there a question? Okay. Okay. So I'm going to go back to this figure that I talked about the other day. And what we talked about mainly last time were these so-called compound nuclear reactions, where the target and the projectile fuse together. They make a composite system which lives a relatively long time. The energy that the projectile brings in, plus whatever Q value there is for the reaction, get shared among more or less all the nucleons in the target plus projectile combination that's been formed. And then through random collisions, occasionally a particle or two acquires enough energy to escape. And these are the low energy particles we see emerging from such a reaction. And the other point we talked about briefly at the end was one way to distinguish is by measuring the energy of those particles, but also the angles at which they come out relative to the direction of the incoming projectile. Namely, the compound nuclear ones tend to go off more or less isotropically, more or less the same in all directions, um, whereas the, the other kind of reactions, the ones that produce the high energy particles over here, are what we call direct reactions, and they tend to show this oscillatory behavior, these wiggles, and often are peaked in the forward direction, meaning they tend to go off more or less in the same direction the projectile was traveling. So what I want to do for most of today's lecture is talk about this part diagram, the direct reactions, because they're another very important class of reactions, and they're very useful for figuring out spins and parities of 
nuclear levels and also the structure of the levels that are produced in the reactions. Okay, so now we're imagining, and again, this is a semi-classical view of how it happens. Uh, these direct reactions are what you might call peripheral reactions. In the, the compound nucleus, I'm imagining my projectile comes along and basically stops and fuses with the target. Okay, and you can think of that, again, in semi-classical terms, as being more or less a head-on collision. Okay, I've aimed things through random luck, basically, so that the beam and the projectile line up perfectly, and uh, the beam and the target, rather, line up, and they form a head-on collision. Here I'm imagining that I haven't done such a good job of aiming, and the projectile is a little bit off-center, okay, so that it barely touches the nucleus. Okay, that's what I mean by a peripheral collision. And these kind of reactions then don't lead to a compound nucleus. It isn't likely that that projectile will fuse with the compound nucleus. What will happen instead is the, the projectile will more or less continue going in the same direction. It might transfer a particle or two from the projectile to the target, or it might rip a proton or two or neutron or two out of the target that will get attached to the projectile, and that new composite object will keep on going. And we'll see how this works in a minute. Uh, this tends to be relatively more important at higher energies than the compound nuclear reactions. And the re part of the reason for that is, ha has to do with the quantum mechanical nature of this, that as the projectile energy increases, its de Broglie wavelength decreases, okay? Remember this formula. The wavelength we associate with a particle depends inversely on its momentum. And so if I had a, a proton, for example, of one MeV approaching a heavy target, its de Broglie wavelength would be about four femtometers, which is comparable to the size of most nuclei. So that proton would, in effect, see the whole nucleus because its wavelength is a measure of how much space it's sampling as it moves by. Whereas if I had a 20 MeV proton, the wavelength, according to that formula, is now one femtometer. That's more like the size of an individual neutron or proton. And so as that proton flies by, it doesn't really see the whole nucleus anymore. It's seeing only individual neutrons and protons, and in particular, only those that are near the edge of the nucleus that the proton happens to be approaching. So direct reactions tend to be more important at relatively high energies. And we talk about a time scale for the direct reactions being very different than the time scale for the compound nuclear reactions. Uh, remember, in the compound nucleus, the projectile and target fuse, the energy has to get randomized, and that takes a while. And the time scales are 10 to the minus 16, 10 to the minus 15 seconds, something like that, for that equilibration to happen, and then a random collision leads to a neutron or proton being evaporated. For the direct reactions, it happens much faster. And so here we're imagining, now I've got a deuteron, let's say it's 20 MeV, that's flying by some reasonably large mass target, say A equals 50. So the kinetic energy is what I mean by the 20 MeV. So I can calculate using non-relativistic kinematics because the kinetic energy is small compared to the rest mass energy of a deuteron. So classical mechanics works just fine. Of course, if you want to do it relativistically, you'll get the right answer, but it isn't necessary. So I just solve, for, I'm trying to solve for the velocity basically. So V squared over C squared I get from here. It's 40 MeV divided by, and I'm saying the mass of a deuteron is about 2,000 MeV. This is just meant to be an order of magnitude estimate. So that ratio is 2 times 10 to the minus 2, and I take the square root of that, and 4, and if I convert it then to centimeters per second, it's 4.2 times 10 to the 9 centimeters per second. If I ask myself how long does it take for that deuteron to fly across the diameter of the nucleus, it's 10 femtometers divided by that speed. It's 10 to the minus 22 seconds. Okay? That's the time scale for a direct reaction. It's basically the transit time for the projectile to cross the nuclear diameter. And that's many orders of magnitude faster than the time scale for those compound nuclear reactions. Okay? And we're imagining what's happening is the projectile is just flying by, and while it's in the vicinity of the nucleus, a reaction happens. It can be elastic scattering, it can be inelastic scattering, it can be transfer, it can be pickup. But it's all happening as the projectile's flying by. And so the sort of prototypical direct reaction is what's called a DP reaction. And this is one that's been studied a great deal on many, many nuclei. 
So the idea is you have a deuteron, which you know is a very loosely bound system of a single neutron and a single proton. And we're imagining in this cartoon, the deuteron is aimed a little off center. I've got some target there. And what happens is the deuteron comes by and only the neutron interacts with the nucleus and basically gets absorbed by the target nucleus. And the proton, which was in the deuteron, hardly notices anything happened and keeps flying along and then later on just happens to look over and see the neutron isn't there anymore. Okay? And what tends to happen then is the protons go more or less off in the forward direction okay? and typically end up with half the energy the deuteron had initially. Okay, because in, the, in this case what's happening is the neutron and proton are equally sharing the energy and momentum of the deuteron and the proton keeps on going and it continues with more or less the same velocity it had to start with and therefore half the kinetic energy of the, the deuteron. That's called a DP reaction. It's not the only kind of transfer, but you can understand, I think, why this one might be more likely, or let me ask you, why do you think that would be more likely than having the proton be absorbed? as opposed to the neutron. Exactly, the Coulomb barrier. Remember, this guy has a positive charge. That's got a positive charge. That tends to push the proton away and make it less likely that it's the thing that will be absorbed. So this is more likely, but DN reactions do happen. It turns out they're harder to study experimentally, but they do happen. Okay, and so this is, again, kind of a prototypical example of what the angular distribution of those outgoing protons would look like, okay? So we're imagining it's a DP reaction. I'm measuring the number of protons or the cross section for that particular reaction as a function of angle. And the angle is measured relative to the direction that the deuteron was initially traveling. So zero degrees means that's where the deuteron was traveling. 180 is the opposite direction. And what you see is there's a large peak in the forward direction. But then you do see this oscillatory behavior. And that's actually caused by interference of reactions that happen on one side of the nucleus and the other interfering. Okay, it's a quantum mechanical effect. It's very much like the um, optical interference you get when you have an um, opaque disk and you shine light on it. You get interference on the other side. That's what's happening here too. But the important thing is the forward peaking and that oscillatory behavior. So let's talk a little bit more in detail about these direct reactions and see if we can understand a little bit more about the kinematics. So here I've got <coughs> a stationary target. I've got my moving projectile A, and it's coming in uh, some impact parameter I'm calling capital R in this case. And it's reaction. Um, <coughs> it's a DP reaction. Um, so it's producing a proton that's going off at some angle. And let's just go through um, energy and momentum conservation here. So the product nucleus has to move after the reaction because I've got an outgoing proton and I've got an incoming deuteron that's bringing in some momentum. And so in order to conserve momentum, the momentum of the product nucleus has to be the difference between the momentum the projectile came in with, which in this case is the deuteron, minus the outgoing momentum the proton carries away. And remember, these are vector quantities, okay? So the proton doesn't necessarily go off exactly in the same direction as the deuteron was coming in. Uh, your momentum, remember, we can think of as being R cross P. So in this case, the L value, the momentum that's transferred in this reaction to the target nucleus, is this product RP. And I can also use energy conservation to say that P squared equals PA squared plus PB squared minus two PA, PB cosine theta. That's just energy conservation from that drawing. And what I'm trying to do is to solve for the angular momentum in terms of things I can actually measure. And so just rewriting that, that's PA minus PB squared plus two PA, PB, one minus cosine theta. And the point is that there's a relationship then between the angular momentum and <coughs> the, out, the angle of the outgoing particle. Okay, that's what that's saying. There's that one minus cosine theta there. So this P, which is what I'm trying to solve for using energy conservation, which tells me how much angular momentum is transferred, depends on the angle that the outgoing particle goes off at. 
And that's what I make use of in studying these reactions to try to figure out the spins and parities of the states I populate. So just to illustrate this, if we take an example of a DP reaction, so I have a zirconium-90 target, I bombard it with deuterons, I look at protons going off, and so the net effect of that is to add a neutron to zirconium-90 and therefore make states in zirconium-91. So I've added a neutron to zirconium-90 in that process. If you go and look up the masses, it turns out the Q value for that reaction is positive. It's about 5 MeV. And so if, for example, I had a 5 MeV deuteron projectile coming in, then the energy of the outgoing proton would be about 10 MeV. It would be the kinetic energy here plus the Q value. It would be about 10 MeV. I can then use that energy for the proton and that formula up there to calculate the L value, that is how much orbital angular momentum gets transferred to the target nucleus when that neutron gets added to it. You know, again, if you think of it sort of semi-classically, I've got this deuteron whizzing by. A neutron in it attaches itself to the nucleus. It provides a torque to that nucleus, right? It's flying by. It would tend to make the nucleus spin. And the more momentum it transfers, and given the fact that it occurs at a non-zero radius, the more orbital angular momentum it's transferring. So you can see classically how it would make the nucleus spin. And so plugging into this formula then, what you find is the L transfer, how much orbital angular momentum gets transferred, is roughly eight times the sine of theta over two, where theta is the angle that the proton goes off at. And so I can use that formula to calculate then that if the proton goes off at zero degrees, meaning it keeps on going in exactly the same direction uh, the deuteron is traveling, then theta is zero, there's no orbital angular momentum change. If these are backwards, obviously, <laughs> the labels, okay, this should be the L, that should be the angle, sorry. Um, if the proton goes off at about 14 degrees, plugging into that formula, L will turn out to be one. If it goes off at 29 degrees, L will be 2, and so on. And what you see is a qualitative relationship between the angle that the proton goes off at and the amount of orbital angular momentum gets transferred. So that picture I showed you earlier, which had a peak near 0 degrees, must correspond to something like this, where there was no orbital angular momentum change. We'll see in a minute that there are reactions that transfer more and more orbital angular momentum, and what happens is the first peak, first maximum, in that diffraction pattern moves out in angle. Okay, here's some examples of that. So this is now a different reaction. This is a DP reaction on nickel 58. So again, transferring a neutron onto nickel 58 to make nickel 59, and what's being plotted again are the cross sections as a function of the angle that the outgoing proton emerges at. And remember what's going on go back a minute. Okay, so imagine that we're looking at a DP reaction now. These are the outgoing protons. What you see is a set of discrete states. You see a set of peaks that correspond to the energy levels in the product nucleus, which in this case is going to be nickel 59, that are produced when a neutron gets added to nickel 58. So for example, if this were nickel 58 DP, that first peak here would correspond to producing the ground state of nickel 58. And then the next one would be the first excited state and so on. Okay? And then what you do is you look at that particular proton peak. Let's say you look at the ones associated with the ground state of nickel 58. You distinguish them by their energy and you measure how many of them there are as a function of angle for the outgoing protons relative to the deuteron direction. And that's what those angular distributions represent. Okay, so this uh, angular distribution shown up here um, may correspond to the ground state. I'm not sure exactly which one it is, but you can see that the angular distribution peaks essentially at zero degrees. And that, according to that little formula we just wrote down, corresponds to an orbital angular momentum change of zero. Okay, L equals zero in that case. Um, for this group, you can see that the first maximum has been pushed out an angle, maybe to 10 degrees or so. And according to that formula, that corresponds to about L equals 1. There's another state which has a different angular distribution where the peak is more like 20 degrees. That's L equals 2. L equals 3, L equals 4. 
Okay, so again, by measuring the number of protons or whatever particular particle you're studying in the reaction as a function of angle and energy, you can learn something about the orbital angular momentum that gets transferred to the target when that transfer reaction happens. Okay? Now, that doesn't tell you the whole story. Uh, the goal of this kind of work is to try to figure out the spin and parity of the states that are populated in these reactions, as well as where they are in excitation energy. The excitation energy you can measure simply by knowing the Q value for the reaction you're studying and by measuring the energy of the outgoing particle you're looking at. Okay, so by measuring the energy of the outgoing protons from a DP reaction, we can calculate how much energy we must have uh, transferred to the target nucleus and make that excited state. But for the angular momentum, it's not quite so simple. So again, um, let's look at this. Let's take the case of the DP reaction and let's take a case like the nickel 58 DP where we're starting with an even, even nucleus. Okay, those are the simplest cases because as you all know now, what's the ground state spin parity of every single even, even nucleus? Zero plus, okay. So I've got zero plus for my target spin. I'm imagining the deuteron does not fuse with the nucleus. What happens is a neutron from the deuteron gets transferred and the angular momentum that gets imparted to the target nucleus then is the sum of the orbital angular momentum transfer plus the intrinsic spin of that neutron, which is a half, okay? So the product nucleus spin is going to be L plus or minus a half. I don't necessarily know the orientation of the spin of that neutron relative to the orbital angular momentum. So that's why it's plus or minus a half here. So if I have an L equals zero transfer reaction, like the one I just showed you, okay, something like that up there, what's going to be the spin of the product state that gets produced there? What's the J of that state going to be? Well, how much orbital angular momentum gets transferred? Zero, right? We determined from that angular distribution, since it peaks near zero degrees, that L equals zero. So I've got L equals zero, and I've got a spin zero positive parity target on which I'm adding that neutron. So what does the spin have to be of that final state in nickel 59? One half plus, right? It's got to be a half because zero plus or minus a half still makes a state of spin a half. We're not asking, we're just asking for the magnitude of that state. And, jumping ahead just a little bit, um, the parity that you produce goes as minus one to the L transfer, okay? In this case, L equals zero, so minus one to the zero is plus one, so there's no parity change, okay? So in that particular reaction, I make a one-half plus level in nickel 59. Your question? Okay. Um, and so by measuring the orbital angular momentum transfer, which I get from the angular distributions, and knowing the initial spin of my target, I can at least predict a range of spins. I may not necessarily know exactly what spin it's going to be. In this case, because I had a spin zero target, I only have two choices. It's either minus a half. But imagine I had a non-zero spin target. Suppose the spin were one or two. Then I'm going to end up with a range of possible spins here because in general, I don't do a reaction on a polarized target, I d which means I don't necessarily know the direction the target spin was pointing. And so I have to add vectorially the spin of the target to the L transfer. And as you all painfully know now, you get a range of possible outcomes when you do that. The tricky bit here is, unlike the compound nucleus, the deuteron doesn't get absorbed. So I don't have that spin one of the deuteron to think about here. Uh, a lot of times I've seen students puzzle over that that they think I've got this spin one deuteron coming in and I have to account for that. It's accounted for properly because it's got the spin a half of the neutron which was stuck to the target and there's still that outgoing proton which has the other half unit of spin. So this is a very different kind of reaction than those compound nuclear ones. And you have some homework to think about this. Uh, just to show you a little bit more of this kind of stuff, uh, this again, this is zirconium 90 dp. And what's being shown here is the energy spectrum of the outgoing protons. So 
there was a beam of deuterons hitting a, <coughs> excuse me, a stro uh, zirconium-90 target, and the energy of the outgoing protons allows you to figure out which state in the zirconium-91 was left behind. So the highest energy protons, the ones over on the right there, those correspond to leaving the zirconium-91 in its ground state. And then, as I said, you set a gate on those particular protons and measure the angular distribution and figure out the L transfer. And so these reactions are characterized by angular distributions that allow you to figure out the L transfer for each of these groups and then assign at least a range of spin and parities to the states in the zirconium-91 that get produced. Okay. And so based on that kind of information, one can put together a level scheme um, of this zirconium-91. And what's being shown here is the energy of the state. Uh, so here's the ground state. Since we had a spin zero target, the zirconium-90, uh, the L transfer lets you figure out uh, at least the range of spins and parities. And since we have uh, a spin zero target, we know we only can have L plus or minus a half. And you can go and figure out then that the ground state spin and parity, which corresponds to an L transfer of two, is five halves plus. And what these heavy bands are meant to represent is if you go back to your shell model scheme and try to figure out where is it the valence neutron, that last unpaired neutron in zirconium-91 ought to go, it turns out it ought to go into an orbital that has 35 halves plus. And this is a measure of how much this particular level actually looks like that shell model state. Okay, remember, the shell model is an approximation and in a lot of cases, there's more than one way to produce a state of a given spin in parity. And so the shell model allows you to predict the lowest level kind of configuration. But you know you can take more than a single neutron or proton, break the, spin, break the paired spins, and make states that have similar kinds of spins and parity. So this is a measure of the simple-minded single particle shell model, how much of it looks like that state. And it's a lot in this case. Here's another state up here at 1.2 MeV. It has an orbital angular momentum transfer in that DP reaction of zero. And since the target spin was zero, the only possibility is that state have spin of a half and positive parity. And it also looks a lot like a single particle shell model state. The ones higher up, you can see this heavy shading is much smaller, meaning they look less and less like that single particle shell model state. And in fact, need more complicated configurations to explain them. But nevertheless, this is a nice way to get at least some information on the excitation energies and a range of spin, spins and parity possibilities. OK. Um, let's go back a little bit and continue the discussion of resonances, because they play also a key role. And remember, these are states that are formed just above the neutron or proton separation energies. So again, I've drawn a diagram like the one you saw the other day. The narrow lines are meant to represent the ground state and the low-lying excited states of the nucleus. And as we get closer and closer to the neutron or proton separation energies, the density of states, the number of states per unit energy gets a lot higher. And once we cross that band, things qualitatively change. Because below that neutron or proton separation energy, the only way those states can decay is electromagnetically, meaning either gamma ray emission or internal conversion. But as soon as I get above there, then they can stop popping out particles. So I can spit out a neutron or I can spit out a proton. And what that means is the lifetimes of the levels above the separation energy get much, much shorter. And therefore, because of the uncertainty principle, the delta E, delta T business, the intrinsic widths of those states gets wider. And so I end up with this continuous distribution. In between those two extremes, and again, these are really extreme models I'm talking about. You know, thing is, things are never black and white that way. They're shades of gray. And so right around the neutron and proton separation energy, there are still discrete levels, okay, that can be unbound. They can be above the neutron and proton separation energy, but they're so close to it that there's very little available energy to kick that neutron out or that proton out. Those are the states that serve as resonances. So they're discrete states just above the neutron or proton separation energy that can still be identified. And they stick out in, especially in neutron-induced reactions, but you'll see them in proton-induced reactions too. Um, and what we mean by that is you're going to have a very low-energy neutron 
coming up to a target. And that neutron, if it has EV or KEV energies, is very close to that neutron separation energy. It's a free neutron approaching a target. And so if you think of the resulting nucleus that would be produced if that neutron was captured, so it would be a nucleus with the same Z as the target and A would be one unit higher, that composite nucleus would have a ground state down here and that neutron would be coming in at essentially the neutron separation energy for that product nucleus. And if there are states right around there, they can serve as these resonances. And so these resonances, these discrete states, are important, especially in these n gamma reactions, okay? Meaning a neutron comes in, fuses with the target nucleus, produces a resulting nucleus with A one unit higher. That's an n gamma reaction. And so here's a cartoon of that. So we're imagining we've got some target Z and A. We add a neutron to it with very, very low energy. And so these states, if they're there, we can think of them as virtual state, virtual bound states. They aren't really bound. But what it means is if the neutron happens to come in with exactly the right energy to match one of those levels, there's a very high probability the neutron will be captured. Um, what's the most likely thing to happen once I produce one of those states? So imagine the neutron just happens to come up and match the energy of that middle blue state. What, what are the possible ways that state could decay? It can gamma decay or neutron decay, exactly. Right? It can gamma decay because there are literally a million levels below it in that residual nucleus. And so that's certainly one way it can decay. Or, since it's above the neutron separation energy, it can simply kick that neutron back out again. And in general, there'll be a competition between those two decay modes. And it'll depend on the nuclear structure of the state as to which one is more likely. And it'll vary from nucleus to nucleus. Um, the way we describe the cross-section, you've seen this before. This is a slightly different way of rewriting the Bright-Wigner formula. And what it tells you is a way to calculate the cross-section for a particular reaction uh, as a function of energy near one of these resonances. So ER corresponds to the energy of the resonance. E is the energy of the neutron or proton, whatever it is that you're sending in. And there's this factor here, uh, G is what's called the statistical weighting factor. It's just a product of the two J plus ones for the target and the projectile and the residual nucleus, the resonance, okay? And what this formula is trying to say is that the cross section for a particular reaction channel depends on which channel you're looking at, okay? Meaning that once we form this composite system, as we just said, there's a certain width in the resonance but then there's a probability for that resonance to decay by emitting the neutron versus emitting the gamma ray. And that's what these are talking about. Okay. And I think you have a homework problem on that too. And just to show you another example of this kind of thing, this is neutron capture resonances on indium. And what's being plotted here is the cross section as a function of the neutron energy. And notice how low the energies are. This is one electron volt, not million electron volts, but one electron volt. So these are very, very low energy neutrons. And they're being captured on two different indium nuclei. Indium has two more or less stable isotopes, 113 and 115. And these enormous peaks you see here, 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 and here correspond to the neutron just matching a particular nuclear state in one of those nuclei. So the A's represent capture on 115. So those are actually states in indium 116 the nucleus you make by capturing a neutron on 115. And the ones labeled B, that's from capture on 113. So those correspond to states in indium 114. And you can see that, you know, we've done some homework problems and you know from nuclear sizes that typical nuclear cross sections, a large nuclear cross section is on the order of a barn. And these are thousands or 10,000 barns. So these are absolutely enormous cross sections. These resonant cross sections are the biggest cross sections you ever see and they correspond to particular nuclear states. And generally, you see them in these N gamma reactions. Um, some that'll be important later on when we talk about uh, nuclear reactors is the fact that every nucleus will have resonances, okay? 
It's not peculiar to indium, although indium has very large resonant cross sections. Every nucleus will have states just above the neutron separation energy will serve as resonance for neutron capture reactions. And when we talk about reactors, we're going to be concerned with how many neutrons are in a reactor that are available to cause fission. Because fission is what we're trying to do in a reactor. And any other mechanism that absorbs neutrons and doesn't produce fission is a problem. And one of them turns out to be the fact that in the reactors we use in this country, at least, um, we'll see that the uranium fuel that we use only has 3 or 4% U-235 in it, the fissionable isotope. The remaining 95 or 96% is U-238, which does not undergo fission for low energy neutrons. On the other hand, U-238 does capture neutrons. And so it's a sink for neutrons. And this is trying to show you, again, the neutron capture cross-section as a function of energy. And now these are a couple hundred electron volt energies we're talking about. Um, and you can see there are big peaks here. Okay, not as big as in the indium, but still these go up to nearly 1,000 barns. Okay? And what happens then is a neutron that's produced in a reactor will encounter a lot of U-238 as it wanders around. And if the energy happens to be right, it'll get sucked up by that U-238, and it won't be available to induce a fission on another U-235. Okay? We'll see this isn't all bad because uh, what happens next after that neutron gets captured. But this is something we'll spend a lot of time talking about uh, in a few weeks. Um, it turns out these resonances are very useful for identifying material. Um, one of the nice applications of nuclear science is for things like archaeology or biology. Uh, if you have some material and you'd like to understand what it's made of, perhaps you're an archaeologist and you're interested in where this piece of bronze came from, uh, one way to tell has to do with looking at a detailed elemental analysis of that sample. And neutron resonances are one way to do it. So this is a, I think it was a bronze statue that was found somewhere. And they're trying to figure out where this might have come from. And so they bombarded it with neutrons and looked at the positions of the resonant energies. So here they've got a low energy neutron beam. These are 50 electron volts or so. And they measure uh, this bronze. And what they see are peaks at particular energies. And since this kind of work has been done for many, many years, the energies of these states are known for almost all stable nuclei. And so they can go back and say, aha, this peak right here corresponds to neutron capture on silver 107. This one is arsenic 75. That's antimony 123, and so on. So this is one of the techniques we have at our disposal to do elemental analysis, just by looking at the energies of these uh, neutron resonances. And just to show you again that these are not isolated phenomenon, um, these are, this is a, a busy looking drawing uh, that you'll find online. It comes out of the Triangle University's nuclear data group where they've compiled information on all the mass seven nuclei. So that's what's being displayed here. And for example, this is beryllium seven, uh, the states that are known in beryllium seven. And one of the ways you can make beryllium seven is to combine a proton plus lithium six and what they plotted up here is the cross-section for lithium-6 plus a proton to form beryllium-7 as a function of the proton bombarding energy. And what you can see is there are peaks there that correspond to particular states. So that peak corresponds to a resonant reaction on one of the excited states in beryllium-7. These resonances are characteristic of states just above the neutron or proton separation energies, and they show up in lots of different reactions. Okay. Um, we started a discussion of neutrons, and I'd like to continue that because that'll turn out to be important in lots of the things we're going to follow on later. So we've taken for granted the fact that nuclei are made of neutrons and protons. But you know, 100 years ago, that wasn't known. And in fact, it wasn't until the 1930s that the neutron was discovered. Previous to that, people thought the nucleus was made of protons and electrons. And you all know why that can't be true. But the neutron was discovered by using an alpha source, a source of alpha particles, and letting those alpha particles interact with a target of beryllium-9. And what people found was that there was a particle coming out, relatively light, and electrically neutral. And very clever experiments having to do with how that particle then interacted with other material.
they figured out that the mass of that particle was very close to the mass of a proton. And eventually that particle got identified as the neutron. So what's going on here, well, let me ask you this. What kind of reaction do you think that is? We've talked about direct reactions, transfer reactions, nuclear. Which one do you think that is? These are going to be 4 to 5 MeV alpha particles coming out of some radioactive source hitting a beryllium nucleus. Compound? Okay. It could be. Why? Why would you say that? What are the arguments? It, it's like it's evaporating a neutron, right? I've got two protons and two neutrons in my alpha particle. Um, and conceivably, you could imagine it's a transfer reaction where I've transferred a helium-3 to the target and a neutron keeps going. That's a very unlikely kind of transfer reaction because it involves so many particles. Occasionally it'll happen. Uh, the other argument I would make is that it's a low energy alpha particle since it came from a radioactive source. Um, the compound nuclear reactions tend to be more important at low energies. So chances are it's a compound nuclear reaction. Okay? It turns out it is. Um, and one of the things you also know now is that the neutron, a free neutron, is not stable. It undergoes beta decay with a half-life of a little bit more than 10 minutes. And so if we want to do experiments or we want to use neutrons for some purpose, we have to make them. We can't just go buy a bottle of neutrons and have them on the shelf and available to do something with. So we have to make them through some nuclear reaction or some radioactive decay in order for us to use them for anything. Okay, unlike protons. With protons, I get my bottle of hydrogen gas, I strip off an electron, and I'm in business. I can't do that with neutrons. So neutron sources are an important issue. Where do we get them? So we can make neutrons via these alpha N reactions. We can now produce relatively long-lived alpha-emitting nuclei like americium-241. That has a 400-year half-life. It produces alphas with about 5 MeV. And in these neutron sources today, you can actually mix the americium and the beryllium. And so you get alphas interacting with beryllium. They undergo this reaction and they make lots of neutrons. Uh, another way to do it is if you have a target nucleus that has a relatively low binding energy for a, the last neutron, like beryllium-9. It turns out it has a very loosely bound ninth neutron. If you come in with a gamma ray with an energy above that neutron binding energy, you can actually rip that neutron out. And this is the basis for what's called an antimony beryllium neutron source. And what's going on is a gamma ray that's above 1.6 MeV that's produced by the decay of antimony-124 interacts with the beryllium and through this reaction, gamma plus beryllium-9 goes to two alpha particles plus a neutron. You make low energy neutrons that way. Another way to do it is californium-252. It's a radioactive nucleus which undergoes spontaneous fission all by itself. It just falls apart about 3% of the time into fission fragments and plus about four neutrons. And then finally, there's a whole bunch of other nu nu nuclear reactions we can use that produce neutrons of different energies. So for example, uh, what the National Ignition Facility out at Lawrence Livermore Lab is attempting to do right now is this reaction. Okay? They're trying to produce 14 MeV neutrons by fusing together helium and deuterium. So tritium plus deuterium makes helium-4 plus a neutron. The Q value is 17.6 MeV. And if the deuteron, or, or if the total energy of these two particles is low, it turns out that about 14 MeV of that total uh, Q value ends up in the neutron, and the remaining energy goes into the helium-4. Uh, they haven't quite gotten to this point yet. What they're studying right now, actually, is D plus D, deuteron plus deuteron. It has a similar reaction, makes helium-3 plus a neutron, but the energy of the neutrons are lower. Okay? And so they've done some shots in the last month or so where they've demonstrated this is going on. They're trying to measure the number of neutrons right now and eventually work their way up to doing D plus T. And ultimately, when we got to talk about nuclear fission reactors, the fission process itself is going to produce a lot of neutrons, which we will then make use of to allow a chain reaction to happen. And an important feature of the neutrons has to do with what their energies are. And these are broad categories which have historical origins. Um, the kind of energies that get produced in all of these reactions are in the KeV to MeV kind of energy range. Those are known as fast neutrons, okay? 
just again a classification. The neutron capture reactions we were talking about have to do with much lower energies, KeV, EV, or even less than that. And if a neutron is allowed to come into equilibrium with its environment, that is rattle around long enough so that it comes into thermal equilibrium with its environment, we call those thermal neutrons. And these are the ones that we're going to make use of the most. Uh, these, if I have a room that's at 300 degrees Kelvin, their energy is a 40th of an electron volt. Okay, extremely low energy. And as you've seen, the cross sections for neutron reactions increase as you go down in energy. So these thermal neutrons typically will have the largest of all cross sections. And when we talk about our reactors, those are the ones we're going to use to make all the fissions happen. Okay, we'll stop here today. We'll finish up the discussion of neutrons, and we'll talk about some uses for these things on Friday. And normal office hours today, 2 to 3.